In this third video of the memory topic, we will be looking at amnesia and neuropsychology. So we need to be able to identify the structures and functions of different brain parts, to define retrograde and interrogate amnesia, to distinguish between semantic, episodic and procedural memories, and to explain the role of the frontal lobe, the hippocampus and cerebellum in memory, and finally, to apply this knowledge uh, to memory. So it's quite a bit of neuropsychology coming up in today's topic and also quite a few key terms. We've got hippocampus, limbic system, semantic, autobiographical, episodic, anterograde, retrograde, procedural, and cerebellum. So there are three types of memories that you need to be familiar with. Firstly, there are episodic memories. These are memories of people, places, and events. The second type are semantic memories. These are memories of ideas, concepts, and facts. If you like, it's your general knowledge. Finally, there's procedural memories. These are responsible for your motor skills or how we know how to do things automatically. So we can walk automatically, um, we can kind of feed ourselves. We learned how to do that when we're very young and then that memory stays with us and we can do it automatically. There's also a kind of fourth type, which is autobiographical memory. And that's a combination of both episodic and semantic memories. So there is a structure in the brain called the hippocampus, which you can see kind of highlighted green or brown. At the top of the slide, there's also a web link. And um, on that website, you can access a 3D brain. It's where I've got this screenshot of an image from. Uh, you can find different brain structures and rotate the brain around. So it's a really good um, website to see different parts of the brain. So the hippocampus is involved in making new memories. It forms part of your limbic system. So it's deep within your brain. Uh, it's kind of the primal part early on in evolution um, it developed. Uh, so new memories are thought to have to pass through the hippocampus before they can enter long-term storage. And the hippocampus is thought to be particularly important to form semantic and autobiographical memories. Once the sensory information has been decoded by sensory areas in your brain, so for example, the thing you saw or heard or smell or taste, once that's been decoded by the correct part of the brain, the hippocampus then combines all of that information into one single experience. So if you're going to a, a carnival, you're gonna see lots of lights, you're gonna hear lots of noise, you might taste some food, you might smell the food. That's all one experience. So the hippocampus is thought to be responsible for combining that all together into that one single experience. A study was done on this by Maguire et al in 2000. Um, and he found that London taxi drivers had larger hippocampal volumes. Now taxi drivers, uh, particularly in London, they have to memorize a lot of roads um, uh, to like different, shortcuts and things like that around the city. Now there are two explanations for this. Either they were born with these large hippocampal volumes um, which predisposed them to becoming a taxi driver so they might be more likely to do that because they you know they, they've got a good memory particularly for places um, or learning lots of information about the London roads caused the change in the hippocampal volume. So we don't know which came first, the hippocampal volume increase or becoming a taxi driver, but we do know that there is a correlation between hippocampal volume and um, tie or years spent as a taxi driver. So related to this, then we're going to look at amnesia. Amnesia is a condition that can significantly affect a person's ability to recall stored memories or to form new ones. There are so many different causes of amnesia. Some of them are brain injuries, illnesses, psychological reasons, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder, medicinal drugs, such as those prescribed to treat Parkinson's, um, illegal drugs, such as cannabis, GHB, MDMA, cocaine, ketamine. Um, a quick note about ketamine actually is that it is used um, in medicine and it's a very strong analgesia, so it um, blocks a lot of pain, but also it can cause amnesia, so patients will not have memory of the kind of traumatic um, event or injury that caused them to be in so much pain. So types of amnesia, there are two types. Firstly, there is anterograde amnesia. So this is being unable to form or have problems forming new memories. Then retrograde, this is when you cannot recall existing memories. Starting with anterograde amnesia then. If you've ever seen the film 50 First Dates, uh, the main character in the female main character, she experiences anterograde amnesia. So you're unable to form or have difficulty forming new memories. And that's because information cannot pass from the short term memory into your long term memory. The reason being is that it cannot go through the hippocampus. So something there is faulty, um, so the hippocampus cannot do its role, which prevents the information from being committed to long term memory. 
People with anterior grade amnesia, they can usually hold a conversation because information stays in their short-term memory. But as we discussed earlier, the short-term memory is only about 20 seconds. So they are unlikely to remember that conversation later. The other type then is retrograde amnesia. So this is when you're unable to recall existing memories from your long-term memory. It does vary in severity from being able to remember absolutely nothing from before um, whatever caused the amnesia or just um, much milder. This is what people with Alzheimer's tend to experience and they cannot recall past memories. Retrograde amnesia, it can be caused by damage to the frontal lobe. So Alzheimer's patients or people who have Alzheimer's show a positive correlation between memory tests that measure retrograde amnesia and frontal lobe damage. So there does seem to be a link between frontal lobe damage and retrograde amnesia. That was conducted by Mays in 1986. The way you can remember this retro is old, um, it's another word for old, um, and they cannot remember their old memories. Looking at procedural memory then, so this is thought to be involved with the cerebellum, which is the brain structure highlighted in purple in the two diagrams there. You can see it's right at the base of your brain, by the brainstem. So procedural memory is often referred to as motor skills. We discussed how it's you learning to walk, drive, feed yourself, tie your laces, anything that involves motor skills. And damage to the cerebellum can affect us or stop us from learning new skills or improving on old ones. The cerebellum helps to time and coordinate complex movements, which is why damage to it makes motor skills very difficult. So we've talked about a lot of key terms today uh, in this video. So you've got five of them, hippocampus, frontal lobe, cerebellum, anterograde amnesia, and retrograde amnesia. And you've got definitions to match them up to. Pause the video and have a go, and then press play when you're ready to continue. Okay, let's go through them then. So the hippocampus, that is the area of the brain in the temporal lobe involved in long-term memory. The frontal lobe, this is an area of the brain involved in short-term memory. The cerebellum, that's the area of the brain associated with procedural memory. And pterograde amnesia, that's the loss of ability to create new memories. And finally, retrograde amnesia, that is the loss of the ability to recall events that occurred before the development of the amnesia. So that's all for the third video in the memory topic.